Here I'm going to go through the slides of section 641, uh, reparameterized to ADL. Um, ADL basically stands for autoregressive distributed lag. And where the name comes from uh, will perhaps be a bit obvious a little later. Well, basically, we start out as follows. Okay, presume we, we know that TGP, that stands for Data Generating Process, but it's not so important. Uh, let's assume you think the model is something like this. We have uh, a dependent variable, an explanatory variable x, we have an error term, and you think that error term is AR1 ha is correlated of order 1. Okay, so that may come from AR1 process instance and the question is now what, what to do here how we're going to approach that is as follows let's just get the uh, uh, the next next bit of the of the slide in so here we go we're going to ask the question should we rather specify the following model. Okay, so let's compare 132 with 134. We have the same dependent variable. We have a constant that's the same. Well, it is a constant in both, not necessarily the same. And we have xt in here. And here we now have ut, but what's new in this model is these lag terms. So, and what I'm going to show in this section is that in fact these two models, 132 and 134, are very very similar but not identical. And therefore we're going to conclude, because they are so similar, we're going to con conclude that often a model of type one three four is a sensible sensible strategy if you have autocorrelated error terms. Terms. Okay, and I'm going to demonstrate why that is the case. Before I continue at this stage, I actually should uh, correct a little thing. Th this should not necessarily, this should not be the same ut. So we're going to change this to a w, a wt. Okay, so here we have wt as the error term. So now I basically want to show that 132 in combination with the ar1 for the ut in 133 is very similar to equation 134. One, we're going to start, we're going to have to do a little bit of algebra now and we're going to start by restating the model in 132 for time t minus 1. Okay, If that model is true in time t it will also be true in time t minus 1. So I um, forgot that I had that sentence already here basically. Okay, here we go. We restate 132 for t minus 1. That is this equation here. And then we solve this equation for ut minus 1. So we bring ut minus 1 on the left hand side and everything else on the right hand side. And we get we get this guy. Okay. Let's put that result to the side for the time being and let's go back to up here to 132 and 133. Now let's do a little bit of manipulation here. What we're going to do is we're going to replace the ut with the right hand side here. Okay, We're going to replace ut with rho ut minus 1 plus vt. So let me just put that in here. That is the equation 
136. Okay, so uh, to get to this stage, we uh, substituted for ut in equation 1, 3, 2. Okay, so this guy here is ut, and we know that from equation 1, 3, 3. So, why have we done this? Well, basically what we're now going to do is, we, we have a ut minus 1 here, and we know what ut minus 1 should be from what we did in uh, 1, 3, 5. So, let me now substitute for ut minus 1 in 1, 3, 6. And that is what we have here. Okay, so basically what you can see here in 137, that is just what we have in 136, just with ut minus 1, ut minus 1, replaced with what we have in 135. So now it's just a little bit of algebra, we uh, factor out this uh, parenthesis here, so we have the error term vt here in the back. We can see that there are two constants, this one and negative rho alpha, so we can uh, collect that together. Then we have the uh, beta plus xt, that's just from the original model, that's here and that's here. And then we have um, negative rho times beta times xt minus 1. So that's here. And then we have rho times phi t minus 1. That's here. And we have the error term vt. That's here. So, so far, what I now want to show is that this is actually pretty similar. So 139 is very similar. To 134. Remember, how did we get to 139? To 139, we basically just got from 132 and 133 together, and we manipulated this. But now I wanted to show that this well, manipulation gives us something that's very similar to 134. So let me just copy uh, 134 down here. Okay, so that's 134 again. And uh, let me take away a few of the colored bits. So the colored bits are okay for the time uh, gone for the time being. So I want to compare what we have here. We have a constant. That's the uh, green bit here, and the green bit here. Then we have a part with x t. That's here. We have a part with xt minus 1, and we have a term with yt minus 1. So we have, and then we have error terms. So we have all the same, the same parts. But now, importantly, let me count parameters. Count parameters. In 1, 3, 4. Sorry, 1, 3, 4. How many parameters have we got? Let me take red here. We have gamma naught, gamma 1, gamma 2, and gamma 3. So that is gamma naught, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, 4 parameters. What about 139? Here we have alpha, and it appears here again, and we have rho, and we have beta, and all the remaining parameters are again alpha combinations of rho, alpha, and beta. So here we have alpha, rho, and beta. 
and we can recognize these three parameters from our model up here, 1, 3, 2, 1, 3, 3, because these were the three parameters we had in here, alpha, beta, and rho. So since we only manipulated 1, 3, 2, and 1, 3, 3 to get to 1, 3, 9, we haven't introduced any other parameters, so we have only three parameters here. So you can see, while these two models have exactly the same terms, they're not the same because 1, 3, 9 which is, comes from 1, 3, 2 and 1, uh, 3, 3, only has three parameters. Now that means 1, 3, 9 cannot be estimated by all s because it's not linear in parameters. Okay, and that reflects the fact that it's not really that easy to estimate this combined this combined model. However, 134, and let me put that in green because it's nice and easy, can be estimated by OLS. Okay? And this is why this type of model is quite popular. It will basically be it will allow you fairly similar dynamics to our model with auto regression and with autocorrelated residuals, but it's sort of easier to estimate because we can estimate it by OLS. So this sort of persistence that comes through the error terms is now partly captured by including these lag terms. And that explains why it's so popular to explain these lag terms. Now that I'm here, I thought I may as well uh, continue and uh, talk something about new West standard errors. That was uh, 642. So this is some additional reading. I think that's the best reading on new West standard errors. Um, the sort of problem with Wooldridge is that um, Wooldridge does it in observation-wise form form and that is by far not as convenient as the matrix form. That uh, actually that should be an E on screen. So we know that if our error terms, so let me first state uh, the model again. Okay, uh, let's say we have a model y equals x beta plus u where the variance of u is equal to omega. Now, what we have learned before is that if the u are heteroscedastic, let me just abbreviate it with hs, and or autocorrelated, that's the AC, then the correct formula for the variance of beta hat, and really beta hat all s, that's what I mean here, but we're not talking about any other estimators, so I'll leave that away, is this formula, okay, this beauty here. We've derived that in the heteroscedasticity case. I told you already in the autocorrelation case exactly the same. So this is where we are. So in practice, however, we need an estimate for omega. Because omega, our variance covariance matrix of u, is unknown. Okay, because it's unknown, that's why we had to test whether it is described by heteroscedastic, heteroscedasticity and or autocorrelation. If we knew what omega was, we could immediately see whether the values on the diagonal are different and whether there are non-zero values on the off-diagonal, which would indicate autocorrelation. So in practice, we need an estimate for omega. Let's just have a uh, little flashback to heteroscedasticity. Okay. A flashback to 
to heteroscedasticity or we'll just rem remind ourselves what we did there and then it's going to be a little bit easier to understand what we do in the autocorrelation case. So what basically for the I'm going to repeat what sort of estimate we used for heteroscedasticity and that then delivered the white standard errors and then we'll introduce a slightly different estimate for omega that will be the new vest uh, methodology and that will deliver what are called new vest standard errors and they are useful for when error terms are autocorrelated. So this is what we did uh, for heteroscedasticity. We needed the structure so this was the structure of a heteroscedastic omega. Okay. Importantly we had differing values on the diagonal and the trick. So that was Halvide's trick was to get an estimate, that's why we have that hat on here of omega. We take our estimated OLS residuals and put them on the diagonal. Okay, so these are the squares of the estimated OLS residuals. Okay, that was useful because we argued that u u one hat squared was some sort of proxy for this was some sort of proxy for this one by itself a pretty rubbish one because we estimate a variance on the basis of one observation but in the context of using that omega hat in this formula up here it turned out to be pretty good. The question is now what do we do if we have autocorrelated residuals. So place that in here. So that was the so far the end of the flashback. Now we are with autocorrelated residuals. Let's compare firstly the structure of so this this guy here is now the the structure of omega if the u's are autocorrelated. Okay, so we have our variances on the diagonal that could still differ. Okay, so we could have heteroscedasticity as well. But now instead of having zeros on the off diagonal elements, we now have potentially non zero values here on the off diagonal. Okay, and it's symmetric, so we have exactly the same values up here. So what is what is this guy? This guy here. That is the covariance. Sorry, the covariance of u one and u two. Okay, and then the next guy here. That is the covariance of u one and u3. So now we basically need an estimate of this omega but that means we now need an estimate of an awful many values. Okay, All the diagonal elements we in principle know how to do that and all these off diagonal elements. Let's consider what a straight replication of the white strategy would deliver. So we would again proxy the diagonal terms. Let me just highlight them with green. Okay, we would proxy the diagonal terms again with our squared estimated residuals because the argument that was valid before that they deliver information on the variance of the first error term, the variance of the second error term, and so forth, that is still valid. But now what about our covariance between u1 and u2? The argument is now that the terms that give us information on this guy is just 
you, the first residual multiplied with the second residual. Okay, that is sort of a covariance term for that particular uh, covariance. And then the same, if we want to know the covariance between u1 and u3, we need to know this term here. Okay, the cross product between u1 and u3. That is that's got what's gonna. That's the only information we have that's gonna deliver information on that unknown term, on that sigma 1, 3, and so forth. So you can see the indices here match each other. And you could do that for the entire, you could do that for the entire term. Now if you if you do this, we should note that this is actually exactly the same. So omega hat here is exactly the same as u hat times u hat prime. Now how does that come? Let's first define what do we mean with u hat. That is the vector of all estimated residuals. Okay, all the way down to we have capital T observations, u hat capital T. This would be our u hat. And if you now calculate, if you sit down and calculate u hat times u hat prime, what you get is exactly this omega hat. Now that means, remember what we need to calculate here is this variance covariance term. Okay, that means let's just look at this center bit here, x prime omega x. Now what would happen if we now used our particular omega hat in here. So we uh, let me just copy this from over here. So what we would get is this term. That's the center center term the center term center term from our equation for variance of beta hat. Okay? X prime and now instead of omega we use the omega hat. So since omega hat is just u hat times u hat prime we substitute for the omega hat u hat times u hat prime and then I just put parenthesis around here x prime u hat and u hat times x prime now of course and here is now the insight the key insight what does this guy do it basically calculates whether the x and u hats are related Okay, that's what these two guys, and this is basically the same, just prime. So basically, we're cal the, each of these terms in parenthesis calculates this. But we know the answer to this. The answer to this is no. And that means that this guy is zero. That was, again, one of the properties of OLS residuals. What does that mean? That means if we used if we used omega hat as in equation one four three, what would we get for the variance of beta hat? Well, the center term is going to be zero. That means the entire variance would be zero. So in one word this is useless okay because the variance of zero for beta hat doesn't make sense so that means our straight extension of the white trick doesn't work and here comes the new west trick oh I may need a new um, file So here's the trick. I just have to rearrange a little bit. Uh, let me copy this across. Here is our new estimator for omega, omega hat, and a little subscript nw for new vest.
If you look at this, firstly the diagonal is exactly the same, the squared residuals. That's exactly the same as our sort of naive estimator omega hat we used here. And then the, the next most obvious thing that has happened is that we have set some values here to zero. Okay. So basically, we're only having values on the diagonal, then on the next subdiagonal, and here on the next subdiagonal. So here we have basically two two subdiagonals, and then the diagonal. Let me do that in red. Okay, and then up here it's exactly the same because it's symmetric. So these values here will be the same as these values. Okay, so this is this is the structure. It doesn't always have to be two subdiagonals. It could be three or four. I'll I'll say just a quick word to that later. Now I don't really want you to know any particular detail here. That's not that's not important. All I want you to realize it is that by basically re setting a lot of zeros, we have achieved two things. There's only, there are fewer terms we need to estimate, okay? only those on the subdiagonals, and we have broken up this little relationship. This was based on the properties of the OLS residuals, and that just destroyed our idea because it uh, achieved that the variance of beta hat would have been zero had we used that omega hat, and that was not uh, not really nice. And then there is one extra element in this guy. Okay, you can see new terms here. W1 on the first subdiagonal, either above or below, and then uh, W2 on the second subdiagonal. These are sort of waiting terms. Otherwise, these terms are exactly the same. As the ones we had uh, we had before, okay. So this u1 hat times u u hat two and u1 hat times u3 hat. All these terms they appear, appeared before as well, okay. In our naive in our naive model. Now we have these waiting guys. Now it turns out you could actually put in front of this one a waiting of one, okay. So basically what New West now does is they decided to, to introduce this waiting scheme. Now this waiting scheme is possibly best illustrated in, in a little sort of uh, a little graph. And we have that here. Here I'll just put it right next to it. Okay. So on the diagonal we have very dark values. That means here we have weights of 1 in here, okay, there are weights of 1. Then the, the light grey ones, these are the W1s, okay, W1, W1 here as well, and everywhere here we have W1 on the first subdiagonal, and then on the second subdiagonal we have W2s, okay, W2 here, W2 here, okay, this is 2 too small for you to recognize, but perhaps you can recognize the colors here, okay? And the colors are here as well. So basically we superimpose, and you could imagine, of course, and all the others here are zeros, okay? These are all zeros, and that means we have zeros here. So basically, New Invest proposed to superimpose this sort of weighting scheme onto our naive estimator. And it turns out that this is the trick we need. Okay, This is exactly the trick uh, we need. And it turns out that if we calculate omega hat like this, we can perform nice inference. Uh, let me just get the, uh, the next term here. So. Uh, firstly, we have this over here. 
I've already described what these uh, what these cells indi indicate uh, related to these uh, to these weight indicators, and the, the weight scheme is such that we have the closer we are to the diagonal, the larger the values. So W1 would be larger than W2, W1 would however be smaller than 1, and W2 would be larger than 0. So these values are between 1 on the diagonal and 0 somewhere else, far enough away. So I may also say I said that not necessarily will we have two of diagonals here. Okay, in the illustration we had two. This value here is called g. Um, in general, we calculate g as such. Okay, it's a function of the sample size. So the more observations we have, the fewer zeros we will use here. Okay, and if you use, fortunately, you don't have to do this calculation yourself. Again. EViews can calculate new y standard errors and how does EViews decide how many of these off diagonals we need is basically with this formula. Okay, so this is how EViews decides how to use this. Now the important the important um, thing to note here is the following. If we have if we have autocorrelated error terms and we possibly know that because we found that the residuals are autocorrelated, the estimated error terms, then calculating the variance of beta hat with this scheme, okay, so you realize it's our general variance formula, it's just this omega hat nu rest that just comes from up here, okay, then we can use this can use this for inference. Okay, so if you wanted, for instance, if you wanted to test a null hypothesis that the j element is equal to negative 3.4, if that hypothesis made sense, and I'd say the alternative, so I'm just making that value up, that beta j is unequal to negative 3.4, then you can use a t-test where you take your estimated value, you subtract your hypothesized value, and you divide by the standard error of beta j hat, but that now needs to be the new rest standard error. So that means it's the this guy here is a matrix, okay? If if that is k by one this guy here is going to be k by k, so the square root, the j diagonal element will give us the variance of beta hat j and the square root of that will give us the standard error. And this, it turns out, is conveniently standard, normally distributed, again asymptotically. Okay, so this allows us inference.